In the quiet town of Hexham, Northumberland, two boys unearthed a discovery that would launch one of Britain's most perplexing paranormal cases. It was 1971 when Colin and Leslie Robson, digging in their garden, found two small stone heads. Innocent, at first glance, these crude, human-like figures would become the centre of a series of unexplained and terrifying events. The heads were roughly carved, made from a greenish-grey sandstone and etched with human features. One was referred to as the girl, because of its rounded face, while the other, the boy, had sharper, more pinched features. The boys proudly showed their discovery to neighbours, unaware that their find had just set off a chain of inexplicable events. It wasn't long before the Robson family started to notice strange happenings. Objects in the house began to move on their own, mirrors shattered for no reason, and the heads themselves seemed to shift position when nobody was looking. The family's two daughters were so disturbed by events that they moved out of their room after finding shards of glass mysteriously shattered across their bed. It was actually their neighbours, the Dodd family, who bore the brunt of the initial weirdness. Mrs Dodd dismissed her children's complaints of being touched by something in their room at night. She thought it was imagination, and then one evening Ellen saw it for herself. A tall, dark figure stood at the foot of her bed, a creature part animal, part man, and when the creature touched her, she screamed, and it dropped to all fours, fleeing the room. The story of the Hexham Heads caught the attention of Dr Anne Ross, a scholar of Celtic antiquity. She'd theorised that the heads might be relics of an ancient Celtic head worship, and she took the heads home to study them. But once the heads were in her home, she too experienced strange occurrences. In the early hours of the morning, she awoke to find her bedroom filled with an unnatural cold, and before her stood a six-foot-tall creature, half-man, half-wolf. A few days later, Dr Ross's daughter saw the same creature. It stood halfway up the stairs, and as she watched it, it vaulted over the banister and disappeared into the back of the house. The Ross family continued to witness strange phenomena whilst ever the heads were in their possession. Now, despite Dr Ross's initial belief that the heads were ancient, some scepticism arose. A man named Desmond Craigie came forward, claiming that he had made the heads in the 1950s as toys for his daughter. However, experts remained divided. The heads were composed of materials consistent with local rock formations, but no one could definitively date them. Craigie claimed he'd simply made them in his lunch break one day. The case made the press too. This is from the Hartlepool Northern Daily Mail, Tuesday 22nd of August of 1989. The discovery of two carved stone heads in a Hexham back garden seemed at first unremarkable enough. But when the heads apparently triggered terrifying appearances of a wolf man, the nightmare began. The present occupiers probably wouldn't be pleased with day-trippers gawping at the council house in Reed Avenue, but here, one afternoon in February of 1971, 11-year-old Colin Robson was weeding when he uncovered what appeared to be a lump of stone about the size of a tennis ball with a strange conical protrusion on one side. Clearing the earth from the object, he found that it was roughly carved with human features and that the conical protrusion was actually a neck. Excited by the find, he called to his younger brother, Leslie, who was watching from an upstairs window. The boys continued digging, and soon Leslie had uncovered a second head. The stones, which soon became known as the Hexham Heads, appeared to be representative of two distinct types. The first had a skull-like face, and seemed to everyone who saw it to be masculine. It was dubbed the boy. It was of a greenish-grey colour, and glistened with crystals of quartz. It was very heavy heavier than cement or concrete. The hair appeared to be in stripes running from the front to the back of the head. The other head, the girl, resembled a witch, with wildly bulging eyes and hair that was combed backwards off the forehead in what was almost a bun. There were traces of a yellow or red pigment in her hair. After the heads had been unearthed, the boys took them inside the house, and it was then that the strange happenings began. The heads would turn around spontaneously. Objects were broken for no reason. And when the mattress on the bed of one of the Robson daughters was showered with glass, both girls moved out of their room. 
Meanwhile, at the spot at which the heads were found, a strange flower bloomed at Christmas and an eerie light glowed. It could be argued that the events in the Robson household had nothing to do with the appearance of the heads, and that they were instead poltergeist phenomena triggered by the adolescent children of the Robson family. But the Robson's next-door neighbour, a Mrs Ellen Dodd, underwent a truly unnerving experience that could clearly not be explained away so easily. I had gone to the children's bedroom to sleep with one of them, who was ill. My ten-year-old son, Brian, kept telling me that he felt something touching him. I told him not to be silly, and then I saw this shape. It came towards me, and I definitely felt it touch me on the legs. Then on all fours, it moved out of the room. Mrs Dodd later described the creature that had touched her as half-human, sheep-like. Mrs Robson recalled that she had heard a sound like a crash and a scream next door on the night in question. Her neighbour told her that the creature that made them was like a werewolf. Mrs Dodd was terrified and was rehoused by the local council. Eventually the heads were removed from the Robson's house, and the house itself was exorcised, and all was quiet in Reed Avenue. Meanwhile, however, a distinguished Celtic scholar, Dr Anne Ross, had become interested in the stones. In an article for Folklore, Myths and Legends of Britain, Dr Ross claimed that the heads were about 1,800 years old, and had been designed to play a part in rituals. When the heads were banished from the Robson's house, Dr Ross had taken charge of them, and she too saw the werewolf in her Southampton home. It was about six feet high, slightly stooping. It was half animal and half man, and the upper part, I would have said, was wolf, and the lower part was human. Again, the heads were removed and the house was exercised. The story took on a new twist in 1972, when Hexham man Desmond Craigie announced that the Celtic heads were actually a mere 16 years old. He claimed he had made them as toys for his daughter Nancy when he had lived in the house in Reed Avenue that was now the Robson's home. He worked with artificial cast stone, making objects such as concrete pillars. He made three heads for her in his lunch break and took them home for her to play with. Then from the Leicester Daily Mercury, Thursday 21st of December 1989. It was to be a fateful day for the Robson family as 11-year-old Colin Robson and his 9-year-old brother Leslie scampered into the kitchen of their family house outside Newcastle-upon-Tyne. "'Look what we've found!' he cried out to his mother, and Mrs Jean Robson looked dubiously at the two earth-covered objects, both about the size of a tennis ball, and forced herself to be impressed. "'Very interesting,' she told her sons. "'What are they?' "'Well, heads, of course,' said her eldest son impatiently. "'We found them when we were digging in the garden.' Looking more closely, Mrs Robson saw that Colin held in his hands tiny stone heads. The first had a skull-like face and was greenish-grey in colour, and sparkled with what seemed to be quartz crystals. The other resembled the face of a witch, with bulging eyes and hair that was combed backwards across the forehead. The boys washed the objects under the kitchen tap, and then proudly placed them on the sitting-room bookcase— How could anyone have guessed that on the winter afternoon of 1972 they had brought a demon into the house? One night a window shattered without warning, covering the sleeping children in glass. The terrifying phenomenon even moved to the house next door, as the neighbour, Mrs Ellen Dodd, was later to testify. I had gone into the children's bedroom to sleep with one of them who was ill. My ten-year-old son Brian kept telling me that he felt something touching him, and I told him not to be silly. Then I saw this shape in the room. It was like some terrible blurred creature crawling around the floor on all fours. I screamed, and it disappeared. The effect on Mrs Dodd's health was so severe that she was later rehoused by the local council. The heads were removed from the Robson's house, and the premises were exercised by a local priest. That should have been the end of the story. But in fact, there were still several terrifying chapters to come. The heads came into the possession of a distinguished Celtic scholar, Dr Anne Ross, who claimed that they were nearly 2,000 years old and were created to take part in an ancient occult ritual. The heads arrived at the Ross's house and almost immediately strange things started happening. Dr Ross recalled that on the first night, both my husband and myself woke up in the bed convinced that some evil was near and that the family was in danger. Something made me look towards the bedroom door, and as I looked, I saw this thing going out of it. It was at least about six feet high and half animal and half man. It was covered in dark fur, and I saw it very clearly. And then it disappeared. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. 
A few days later, Dr Ross and her husband arrived home from a trip to London to find their teenage daughter in a state of shock. Again, Dr Ross takes up the story. She was in a terrible state and told us that she had opened the door and the black thing, half a man and half a creature, had rushed into the house and gone into a room at the back. My daughter had spent the rest of her time locked in her bedroom, but when we looked into the room, which the creature is supposed to be hiding in, nothing was there. We immediately decided to get the heads out of the house, and the moment they went, it was as though a cloud had been lifted from our lives. She continued, The creature appeared to be very real. It was not something shadowy or only glimpsed out of the corner of the eye. It was noisy, and everyone who came to the house commented on a definite presence of evil. Dr Ross was convinced that the heads were Celtic in origin and carried a mystical curse, a view shared by an inorganic chemist named Dr Don Robbins, who believed that mineral artefacts could store visual images of the people who made them. Dr Robbins took the heads home in order to study them himself, and on the way back, all the electrical systems in his care went dead. He took the heads out of the vehicle and immediately everything started to work again. I was convinced these lumps of stone were possessed of very definite powers of evil, he said. But one of the biggest mysteries about what have become known as the Hexham Heads is, where are they now? They have not been seen for over ten years. Perhaps even now they are lurking in a junk shop or antique stall, waiting for the chance to start their malign mischief once more. The mystery gets even deeper because not only the astute of you will have noticed that in the first newspaper article there was a mention of three stone heads and we only have a story about two of them so where's the third one but also the other two vanished in 1978 and to this day their whereabouts are still unknown. More than 50 years later, the Hexham Heads continue to intrigue and puzzle those who hear this story. The theories abound, of course, but the truth behind these strange artefacts remains one of Britain's most enduring mysteries. Will these heads resurface? And if they do, will this strange phenomena return as well? Now, there are some interesting parallels between the Hexham Heads case and other paranormal phenomena worldwide, including, probably quite notably, Skinwalker Ranch, particularly with the appearance of wolf-like entities. So, at Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, reports of strange and wolf-like creatures are part of the area's long history of unexplained events. In particular, there have been sightings of an unusually large and supernatural wolf, sometimes bipedal, sometimes on all fours. The idea of an entity that moves between worlds or dimensions seems common in both cases. There is the Bell Witch in Tennessee, which shares a few elements with the Hexham Heads case. Poltergeist-like activity and the appearance of an entity pet, human pet, animal terrified witnesses. And while not directly linked to wolf-like creatures, I mean, I think the Bell Witch one was something like a dog with a rabbit's head or something. The Beast of Bray Road in the USA is another example of a wolf-like creature spotted in Wisconsin during the late 20th century. Witnesses describe it as a werewolf-like figure standing on two legs with glowing eyes and possessing immense strength. Similar to the wolf entity in Hexham, the beast of Bray Road has been reported to exhibit intelligence and a terrifying presence with no definitive explanation for its existence. So, why a wolf is my question, or one of my questions, put it that way. The choice of a wolf as the manifestation in cases like the Hexham Heads and similar phenomena worldwide, it might not be as simple as it's a plain old wolf. The appearance of a wolf-like creature in paranormal or supernatural contexts seems to tap into deep-rooted symbolism and folklore, which might provide a little insight into why this specific form is chosen, if indeed the entity has a choice in the matter. And I'd like to just explore this idea of, you know, the entities manifest, but do they get to choose what they manifest as? Or are they influenced by... An object such as the heads or are they in influenced by some sort of unconscious cultural memory of the person viewing them or indeed some sort of cultural or spiritual memory of their own existence from another time it's a, something to explore and i think they could but of course the wolf has long been a symbol in many cultures and it embodies a range of potent and Sometimes admittedly contradictory meanings, doesn't it? It's danger, the wild, it's untamed nature, and it does also relate to spiritual transformation. In folklore and mythology, wolves are often 
liminal creatures you know they exist on the edges or in that in the gap between humanity and paranormal realms don't they they bridge this divide between the natural world and the unknown they're sort of wild forces that humans can fear or have in history also admired in european folklore the wolf is frequently linked to themes of transformation notable through legends of course of werewolves and in these stories humans transform into wolves embodying some primal violent and potentially uncontrollable aspects of ourselves and in celtic culture the wolf can also be seen as a guardian a guardian of the threshold between the living and the dead and given dr Anne ross's theory that the hexam heads may have had links to celtic head worship and the wolf-like manifestation probably represents something a bit deeper a sort of guardian or an embodiment of ancient celtic spirits wolves of course are predatory you know they would have eaten our ancestors won't they and they were killed off because they were dangerous and when entities or forces manifest as wolves they tap into some ancient and it's almost an instinctual fear isn't it of being hunted or stalked and in the case of the hexam heads the manifestation of a wolf-like figure might just be designed to evoke a response of fear and of course myriad werewolves in other localities dogmen in michigan and you know like the beast of bray road and all those parallels well, what if it's the same force manifesting in all these cases? What if it's the same energy or entity or being that's manifesting as this wolf creature? There's the shared archetype, isn't there? I mean, I imagine most cultures would view wolves as frightening, or they would have done historically, a dangerous certainly to a human. And the concept of a wolf-human hybrid or a transformation from a human into a wolf is prevalent in a lot of literature. So what if there's actually just a single ancient force that manifests in different cultures and locations under different guises, but using sort of similar forms? The Wolfman entity appearing in Hexham or Skinwalker Ranch could be a reflection of this. Maybe it's some sort of primordial force that's beyond our knowledge, of course. And this might explain why people across such varied cultures encounter similar things. There's no definite answer, of course, is there? But the similarities between the Hexham Heads and the Skinwalker Ranch just really jumped out at me, you know. And what about this third Hexham Head? It's believed to have been broken and discarded long before the other two heads were discovered. Desmond Craigie, the man who claimed to have made the heads in the 1950s, explained that there were originally three heads. One was broken and thrown away, leaving the remaining two that were later found by the Robson brothers in their garden. No one's ever found the third head and it's likely lost, having been discarded many years ago. And of course, the other two have vanished as well. Now, you know me, I like speculation and I like what ifs and questions rather than answering mysteries outright. Craigie to me sounds pretty Scottish. I don't know about you, which of course would have strong Celtic roots, wouldn't it? The name's common in parts of Scotland, and it's got connections with various Scottish clans. So Craigie might be considered a name with Celtic heritage, especially linked to the ancient lands and families of Scotland. If Desmond Craigie were linked to such ancestry, it could be an interesting connection to explore, especially if the Hexham heads themselves are theorised to have Celtic origins. This might suggest that Craigie, knowingly or not, has a deeper link to the Celtic past, which could enrich the mystery surrounding his involvement with the heads. So here's a twist for you. Desmond Craigie could be more than just an ordinary man with a mundane explanation. What if Craigie knows far more about the heads, and what if he isn't entirely human? What if these heads are part of a Celtic curse, in ancient times, druids were believed to cast binding spells on their enemies, trapping their spirits within objects like stone effigies. Craigie, whether knowingly or not, might be part of a lineage tasked with maintaining this curse. The wolfman that stalked the witnesses might be the result of such a binding spell, a guardian spirit trapped between worlds, summoned whenever the heads are disturbed. Craigie's family could be responsible for ensuring that the heads stay hidden, preventing the full power of the curse from being unleashed. But there's an even more intriguing possibility. What if 
Craigie wasn't acting of his own free will? What if he was sent by an entity, the very force that manifests as the Wolfman? Perhaps his purpose wasn't to hide their heads, but to get close to them and eventually steal them. In this scenario, Craigie's story of making the heads is a ploy. It's a way to keep the world's attention on the heads and, more importantly, to generate interest in finding the missing third head. This entity might need all three heads to fully manifest in our world, or might need all three heads to block some sort of curse that is damaging it. And Craigie's role is to ensure that the humanity does the work for it. Is it a coincidence that soon after Craigie came out to say he had made the heads, they vanished, and that he just happened to mention that there's a third one out there, somewhere? We'll never know, of course, and that's the fun isn't it? There's an interesting one-liner here in the Newcastle Journal of March 1974, where Dr. Ross basically sort of sweeps the thing under the carpet. The controversy over who made the carved stone heads has taken a fresh twist. For Mr. Desmond Craigie, the Hexham lorry driver, who claims to have made the Celtic idols now lying in Newcastle University's Museum of Antiquities, has made three more. The heads almost exactly the same as the originals, are sitting at the bottom of his garden in Prior Terrace. And now, one of the country's top archaeologists, Newcastle-born Dr Anne Ross, has promised to visit Mr Craigie. Dr Ross said last night, if Mr Craigie really did make the original heads, it is even more interesting. I would say it's a very remarkable thing for a person to do. The original heads were discovered two years ago in a garden in Reed Avenue, Hexham, by two brothers. The heads, at first thought to be Celtic, from at least 1800 years ago then began to haunt a neighbour, a Mrs Ellen Dodd and her family. The heads were sent to Dr Ross, a freelance archaeologist living in Southampton, who said they were probably Celtic religious symbols. And while she had them in her home, Dr Ross too began to feel haunted. The same figure, half human and half beast, that Mrs Dodd saw was again seen in Dr Ross's room. But 53-year-old Mr Craigie said no one dare admit they were wrong. Mr Craigie, who claims he made the originals for his five-year-old daughter Nancy to play with in about 1956, says the heads were made from a mixture of different cements and sands. Dr Ross said, I have been perfectly open-minded about these idols. I never did say they were definitely Celtic or put a date on them, though I thought they were old. As soon as I get a chance, I will willingly go to see Mr Craigie. This from The People. Sunday the 13th of January 1974. Who knows best about the two mysterious ornamental heads dug up in a Tyneside garden? The eminent Celtic scholar and archaeologist, or the bluff Geordie building site worker? The archaeologist, Dr Anne Ross, says they were carved from local Northumbrian stone, perhaps during the Roman-British period about 1800 years ago. But the labourer, Desmond Craigie, claims they are made of sand, and that he turned them out in his lunch break a mere 18 years ago. Dr Ross of Southampton University tells of her findings in a children's educational book called Folklore, Myth and Legends. She describes mysterious spirits and apparitions that appeared whilst the heads, sent to her by a Newcastle museum for examination, were in her house. At his home in Prior Terrace, Hexham, 20 miles from Newcastle, Desmond Craigie told me, the lady has got it wrong. I made the heads for my daughter 18 years ago to show her what sort of work I did. Mr Craigie said he was working for a firm that made artificial stone blocks. I simply scooped up two handfuls of the stuff as if I were making a snowball. I moulded the mixture into two balls and with a knife I carved eyes, ears, a nose and a mouth. Then I shaped rough necks so that the finished heads could stand on a shelf. It took only a few minutes and the next day the heads hardened and I took them home. The Craigies displayed the heads in the window of their old home in Red Care, Hexham. At no time, the family say, did anything mysterious happen in the home, although Mrs Nellie Dodd, who once lived nearby, tells of a mysterious creature touching both her and her son Brian one night in their own home. When the Craigies moved to their present address, the heads were left behind. Later, the two heads sent to Dr Ross were dug up in the Craigie's old garden. At her home in Rose Road, Southampton, Dr Ross, 46, admitted, I may well have made a mistake in dating these heads. That's why I haven't dated them in the new book I am working on. But a special tetralogical examination method showed that they couldn't have been moulded. These heads are extremely evil. Whatever age they are, they have attracted some medieval power. 
Perhaps they were buried on the site of a Celtic memorial as soon as they left my house, she says. The creatures I described in the children's book disappeared. I would like to meet Mr. Craigie and see him make another head. Similar heads have been found across the United Kingdom. There was a stone head unearthed in Boldra during routine digging. Though the exact date of its discovery isn't widely documented, it's believed to be of ancient origin, possibly Celtic again or pre-Roman, based on its simplistic, almost crude design. Like the Hexham heads, this Boldre head is small in size and its rough appearance suggests it might have been carved by hand with simple tools. It's carved out of stone and it features a simplistic representation of a human face, but interestingly a human with the horns of a ram. There's also something called the Corlec Head, which is an Irish stone idol which has three faces on it. It's usually dated to somewhere around the second century and is said to be probably Celtic in origin. So these things do exist elsewhere. Now, I can't find out whether Dr. Ross actually met Mr. Craigie or not. It seems, certainly from the trail in the press, that Dr. Ross, probably quite preoccupied with being on radio and television, Sometime in around sort of 1974, she seems to be quoted as appearing in lots of TV shows. But what about this final twist? Maybe nobody really found anything. Look at this next newspaper article that explains that prior to digging up the heads in the garden, one of the children had made a model of one already. This is from the Newcastle Journal, Friday the 3rd of March, 1972. Something that happened 1,800 years ago may force a mother of six to quit her council house. The Hexham mother says she's terrified of staying there after an eerie nighttime experience which followed the discovery of the two stone heads in her next-door neighbour's back garden. The heads were probably used for worship by a Celtic tribe 1,800 years ago. Yesterday, one of the country's top Celtic experts, Dr Anne Ross, said the claim by 42-year-old Mrs Ellen Dodd that she saw a half-human, half-sheep-like figure which touched her as she lay in bed could not be ruled out. Dr Ross, a Celtic linguist and archaeologist, is to see Mrs Dodd and the boys who found the heads, Colin Robson, aged 11, and his brother Leslie, aged 8, at their homes in Reed Avenue, Hexham, in May. Dr Ross is waiting for a report on the heads by geologists at Southampton University. She said she would be unable to give a final opinion until she gets the report and has made her on-the-spot investigation. It was more than likely that the heads, two and a half inches high, were made by Celtic tribesmen whose main cult was to worship heads as gods. Quite often they worshipped human heads taken from their enemies. Dr Ross said she would have to examine the site near a privet hedge where the heads were found before she could determine whether the Robson's garden and house are over a shrine or burial ground. On Mrs Dodd's claim, she said there is no doubt that if there was a Celtic shrine there, and this is yet to be proved, one would not be surprised to hear of the supernatural manifestation. There are other examples of this on the continent and in Britain where shrines have been found and where there have been hauntings. Mrs Dodd said, I've asked the council for a move because I'm too nervous to stay here now. I had gone into the children's bedroom to sleep with one of them who was unwell, and my ten-year-old son, Brian, kept telling me that he felt something touching him. I told him not to be silly, and then I saw this shape. It came towards me, and I definitely felt it touch me on the legs. Then, on all fours, it moved out of the room. I was absolutely terrified, and I screamed for my husband. The boy's mother, Mrs Jenny Robson, said, The unusual thing about this is that before the heads were found... Colin made a clay head at school. It's remarkable in its likeness to the heads found in the garden. Colin said the idea of making this head just came to him. Mrs Robson added that neither she or her family had experienced anything similar to what had happened to Mrs Dodd. What do you think about this one? You let me know in the comments section below, please. Hit the like button, it's the thumbs up button in the corner there, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, and share this video with your friends and all that good YouTube-y stuff. Bye for now.